Hello and welcome to Dove Biology Apes Lessons to Go. In this video, we'll be exploring aquatic life zones. The aquatic equivalents to biomes are called life zones. There are two major types, saltwater and freshwater. The saltwater or marine life zones include oceans, estuaries, coastal wetlands, and coral reefs. The freshwater life zones include rivers, streams, and wetlands. Saltwater and freshwater aquatic life zones cover almost three-fourths of the Earth's surface, 71% of them being ocean systems and 2.2% of them being freshwater systems. Now life in most aquatic systems will be found in layers. Due to requirements for life and their range of tolerance, there are several key factors which determine the types and numbers of organisms that will be found in these layers, including but not limited to temperature, access to sunlight for photosynthesis, the amount of dissolved oxygen available for respiration, and the overall nutrient availability. Now aquatic systems will contain several major types of organisms. First, we'll have plankton or planktonic organisms. Plankton would be weakly swimming or free-floating animals. They include phytoplankton, which are plant-like plankton, zooplankton, which are animal-like plankton, and ultraplankton, which are photosynthetic bacteria. We will also have nekton, which are our free-swimming uh, organisms, which will include things like fishes and turtles and whales. We'll have our bottom dwellers, which we call our benthos, which will include barnacles and oysters. And then finally, we'll have our decomposers. These will be the organisms that break down and help to recycle matter um, in our aquatic life zones. And mostly these are going to be bacteria, but we'll also have slime molds and some aquatic fungus. Our freshwater life zones include standing water, such as lakes, ponds, and inland wetlands, as well as flowing systems, such as streams and rivers. These freshwater systems will provide a number of ecological services, including climate moderation, nutrient cycling, wastewater treatment, and groundwater recharge. In addition, they provide a number of economic services, uh, like production of food in the form of uh, fish and uh, shellfish, drinking water, water for irrigation, and just water for recreation. So the first aquatic life zone that we'll look at is the lake. Lakes are large natural bodies of standing fresh water that are formed from precipitation, runoff, and groundwater seepage. These lakes consist of four major zones each having their own abiotic factors, which are going to influence the kinds of life that we're going to find there. Next to the shore is going to be our littoral zone. This is going to be a shallow area that's going to have plenty of rooted plants, which allow for things like snails and frogs and turtles to exist quite nicely. If we took a boat out to the open part of the lake, we would be in the limnetic zone or the photic zone. This is an open area offshore um, that's able to get lots of sunlight and support quite a bit of photosynthesis. If we dove off of our boat and swam to the middle area of our open water zone, we would be in the profundal zone or aphotic zone. This is going to be a deeper open water area that's oftentimes too dark for photosynthesis. If we swam to the bottom to get a handful of muck, we would be going to the benthic zone, the bottom of the lake, which is going to be nourished by dead matter that will fall to the bottom. If we took um, our muck up to the surface to examine it, we'd find that it would be dark, almost black in color, um, and smelling of decomposition. One way that the nutrient-rich water from the bottom of the lake can come up to the top to feed organisms there, and the oxygen-rich water of the surface can go to the bottom to support more decomposition, is through a process called turnover. Turnover is the process of the lake's water turning over from the top to the bottom. During the summer, the surface layer, or epilimnon, is going to be the warmest while the deepest layer, also called the hypolimnon, is the coldest. 
During the fall, that warm surface water actually begins to cool, and as water cools, um, it becomes more dense, causing it to sink. This dense water is going to force the water of the hypolimnon to rise, turning it over, so that the oxygen is brought from the surface to the bottom, and the nutrients from the bottom are brought to the top. Turnover also occurs in the spring. During the spring, the less dense surface ice is going to melt, becoming more dense and sinking until the temperature at all depths reaches approximately 39 degrees uh, Fahrenheit or 4 degrees Celsius. The sinking of that water combined with uh, wind mixing it causes a spring turnover. Plant nutrients from a lake's environment can affect the types and numbers of organisms it can support. Oligotrophic lakes have very low levels of nutrients and very little organic material along the lake bottom. As a result, it can only support a very sparse fish population. Mesotrophic lakes are moderately enriched and the natural processes of accumulations of sediment and the growth of aquatic vegetation are starting to occur. As a result, mesotrophic lakes can support a diverse and an increasing fish population. Eutrophic lakes are highly enriched with nutrients and have an accumulation of organic sediments. Eutrophic lakes typically have high concentrations of algae or aquatic vegetation, but unfortunately they also have low levels of dissolved oxygen in the water near the lake bottom. As a result, eutrophic lakes have a very dense and much less diverse fish population than oligotrophic and mesotrophic lakes. Our next freshwater aquatic life zone that we'll look at are inland wetlands. Inland wetlands are lands that are covered with fresh water all or part of the time. This of course would be excluding lakes, reservoirs, and streams. There are two major types of freshwater inland wetlands. they are marshes and swamps. The main difference between the two is that a swamp is a forested wetland, whereas a marsh is a non-forested wetland. Inland wetlands perform many natural functions for ecosystems. They can act as a natural sponge and absorb and store excess water that might come from storms. They act as filters and can clean water, as well as provide a variety of wildlife habitats. The final group of aquatic life zones that we'll look at is the flowing water life zones. Water that doesn't sink into the ground becomes surface water. It becomes runoff when it flows into streams. The land area that's delivering the runoff to the streams is called a watershed or drainage basin. The small streams will join to form rivers that will flow into the ocean. In many areas, these streams begin in the mountains as a result of rain or snow that has melted. It will move from this source zone into a transition zone and finally into the floodplain zone. The floodplain zone, or tidal zone, is typically controlled by tides. Once it reaches an area where tides are no longer in control, we oftentimes call this the fall line. The fall line is also where we're going to find a lot of our uh, waterfalls. The source zone is going to be our mountain streams. Source zones typically have cold, shallow, but swift moving waters. As a result, there's a lot of dissolved oxygen because the movement of the water is increasing the amount of oxygen present, as well as the cold water is allowing for greater dissolving of that oxygen. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of places for algae to grow. Um, it maybe can stick to rocks, but there's going to be very little nutrients because of this lack of productivity. Um, trout are great fish that we'll find in this particular life zone due to its need for cold water full of oxygen. As we move from the source zone to the transition zone, we're going to see some significant changes. The width of our flowing water is going to increase. It's going to become warmer, deeper, and much slower moving. As a result, we're going to have much less dissolved oxygen. But because of the slower movement, we're going to have a potential chance for a higher productivity. Black bass would be a major fish that we might find in this particular environment. 
Finally, when we move into our floodplain zone, we're going to still have those warmer, even slower moving waters and much less dissolved oxygen. But there's going to be plenty of productivity with both algae and rooted plants. And so we'll see a lot of um, catfish and the like to be able to support in this particular environment. Now, unfortunately, humans have had a lot of impacts on freshwater systems. One of the things that humans have done to disrupt um, a freshwater system will be to place dams and levees. Dams fragment rivers and they prevent the movement of uh, fish from one area to another and this could impact their ability to spawn. Levees and dikes disconnect rivers from their floodplains. As a result, a lot of excess sediment stays inside of the rivers and doesn't get a chance to be ejected out into um, those areas. That keeps a lot of excess nutrients in the river as well that would have normally been placed out on the land, increasing its fertility. As a result of farming, as well as uh, a lot of uh, care of our lawns, we have a lot of excess nutrients that are being added to aquatic ecosystems through runoff, as well as additional pollutants that are coming from parking lots and buildings. And then finally, uh, in order to produce areas where we maybe are building homes or businesses, we see a lot of destruction of wetland systems, which is then going to impact a lot of their natural abilities to protect us during floods or to help us to clean our waters. It's important for us to identify the important economic and ecological benefits of these freshwater ecosystems so that we can educate ourselves and others and protect them uh, for the future.